covered for. Okay. I, I leave you guys to. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I know you guys. Okay. There's a handout for you guys. Um, well, I think we just have one more. I don't know why it's here. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, do you want to? Yeah, so I think. Um, yeah, not too many, maybe two or three. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think that's actually nice for the. Um, here, so I think we have one more. Uh, Fatima? Oh no, let me get this. Yeah. Can you give this to the lady when she sits down, please? Good evening, and welcome to the co Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist. I'm delighted to see you all here in person tonight and other attendees joining us on our live stream for the first session of our reflections on Lent and the events of Easter through art. I'm Ulrike McGregor. I grew up in Germany. I have a PhD in human physiology and worked for eight years at the Mayo Clinic in the endocrine research unit. I also have a master's in fine and decorative art from Sotheby's Institute of Art in London. This year, we only had six weeks between Christmas and the beginning of Lent, which meant that I started preparing for this Lenten session as soon as I put down the forks for, for my Christmas dinner. Um, so this six part weekly series is already our third time coming together to study and explore works of art, promoting a deeper understanding of the Lenten scriptures we read and hear at Mass. And I thank you, Father Mann, and also all the staff at St. John's, and especially um, Brian, for your support in this endeavor. Although many of you are already familiar with the format from previous years, uh, let me give, however, a brief overview of the standard format for everyone who is joining us for the first time. In the first 10 minutes, I will introduce you to a relevant art-related or art-historical topic. I will then move on to discuss with you in detail three separate works of art, art for approximately 15 minutes each. These works span from the 15th to the 21st centuries 
and are closely connected with the scripture readings we hear during Lent. As we study each of the three artworks individually, I will first provide background information on the artist and the work's historical context. You can follow the background information on your handout that's available here in the chapel or online. This background information will be followed by a short, relevant biblical reading. We will then start my favorite part of the evening, which is to explore the individual works of art together. Initially, with the reading in mind, I will pose questions to you about the work to direct us through the process of close observation. We may comment on the type of artwork, its size, its subjects, the figures and objects within it, or other details. We might observe how the work is organized in terms of color, layout, space, and texture. These descriptive observations can help us to interpret the mood or meaning of the artwork and guide our own personal impressions and response to the work of art. And I look forward to your active participation in this exploration. At the end of each individual reflection, I will briefly summarize what we have discussed and what we have seen, and then leave you with a parting question for future personal reflection. The live stream provides an opportunity to watch the reflection series if you are unable to attend in person. And the lectures remain available online to access at any time, either on YouTube or on, on the Facebook page of the Kokasiedl of St. John the Evangelist. And each of the session is independent of the next. So let's get started. I would like to begin this evening's reflection with a brief introduction about the significance of ashes, which we received yesterday, and the history of Lent itself. First, a few comments about ashes. It was just yesterday we celebrated Ash Wednesday. During mass, ashes in form of a cross were placed on our forehead. Ash Wednesday is observed by numerous denominations within Christianity. Interestingly, Ash Wednesday is one of the most popular days for church attendance especially for non-practicing Catholics and even non-Catholics. The Bible, particularly the Old Testament, reveals to us that ashes are an ancient sign reminding us of A, our mortality, as noted in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, when God says to Adam after the fall, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And this is just one example of multiple ones. And um, I challenge you to come back and find and report more sightings in the Bible about the ashes. Uh, B, it also reminds us, and it is a sign for our need to repent from our sins. As it is written in Job chapter 42, verse 6. And as we shall hear in a few minutes in the reading from Jonah chapter 3, verse 6. And it reminds us of a call to intercede on the behalf of others, as was done by prophet Daniel and Queen Esther. You may remember. Prophet Daniel, a righteous man, who dressed in sackcloth and sat in ashes, praying for the redemption of his people. 
In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus himself recognized ashes and an outside sign of internal repentance. And of note, Ash Wednesday is a public day of penance, and we are invited to show openly our desire to repent and our attention to fasting. This contradicts to what we are called to do during Lent, when we pray, fast, and give alms privately. And now a few words about Lent itself. Ash Wednesday marks the first day of Lent, which comes from the Middle English word Lent, meaning springtime. Lent is typically observed with solemni solemnity and represents preparation for Jesus' death and resurrection at Easter. The key moment in human history. Lent is observed for 40 days, excluding Sundays, and concludes with the Lord's Supper on Holy Thursday. The period of 40 days refers to the number of days and nights Jesus spent in the wilderness without food and drink, as well as being tempted by Satan. As you can see on the list here, the number 40 has marked many important events in the Bible. And here, just to name a few of many examples. Rain fell for 40 days and 40 nights onto the earth while Noah was in the ark. Another example, Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights before receiving the Ten Commandments. As it is relevant to our first painting, Jonah warns the people of Nineveh that God will destroy them in 40 days if they don't repent. And of course, the 40 days between the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension into heaven. The tradition of Lent can be dated back with certainty to the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, although some form of Lent likely existed before then. During Lent, we are summoned to adhere to the three Lenten pillars, which are fasting, praying, and alpsgiving. Lent can lead us to ready our minds and hearts to remember the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. With this brief introduction about the meaning of ashes and Lent, I would like to begin to explore our works of art of this evening. On this slide, you can see the timeline of the different artistic era and periods in European art and where tonight's works fall. Our first painting of the evening is by the contemporary British artist Albert Herbert and was painted in 1987. We then turn to The Last Judgment, painted during the High Renaissance by Michelangelo. We will then end our reflection with a contemplative image of Mary Magdalene entitled Madeline with the Smoking Flame, created by the French artist Georges de la Tour during the Baroque era, so around 1640. Our first painting is Jonah and the Whale. It was painted by Albert Herbert, a British artist, circa 1987. And as I introduce the artist, if it's helpful to you, you can follow along on the handout. Albert Herbert was born in 1925 in London. He studied at the Royal College of Art in the late 1940s and early 1950s. 
alongside a group of artists that became known as the Kitchen Sink Painters. Herbert was principal lecturer at St. Martin's School of Art in the 1960s and 70s. Early in his painting career, Herbert realized that he wanted to make figurative, emotive, symbolic paintings. He was, however, fighting against the tide of times. In the late 1950s and early 60s, waves of American painting led by abstract expressionism burst over British artistic shores. Herbert found abstraction too restrictive, which led him to give up painting in a representational way for a time. He repressed his instinctive drive to make images that tell stories, but eventually found a way back to painting through children's art and began creating primitive figurative etchings. It was while studying at the British School in Rome that Herbert, who had no religious background, was drawn towards Christianity. And some of you may remember, at the beginning of last year's Lenten Reflection, we contemplated the work which was entitled Ash Wednesday. The British art critic, religious sister, Wendy Beckett, described in her 1993 book, The Grace of Love, Albert Herbert as probably one of the greatest contemporary religious artists. Albert Herbert, painter and etcher, died in May 2008. But tonight we will explore this painting. And as you consider our first work of art of the evening, I will quote from the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 17b, chapter 2, verse 10, and chapter 3, verse 3. And I added the quotes, the notations for the quotes, also on the handout, so if you ever interested in going back. I quote, but the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Then the fish, then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes." End of quote. So this painting very much encapsulates the short book of Jonah. Um, and just to give a quick background to what happened before the scene, um, Jonah was called by God to go and to um, to Nineveh and preach repentance to the inhabitants and save them from destruction. However, the first time around, Jonah went the complete opposite direction. So he basically ran away from his call and he got himself into trouble and others around him. So he ended up on a boat, the boat got into a storm, everyone was, was upset with him and once they found out that he was not following God's instructions, they thought, oh, we better get rid of you to save our own lives. So that's what they did. They threw him out of the boat, but then, as we just heard, God sent the fish. And through God's grace and his guidance, Jonah ended up exactly where he was supposed to go, right on the shore of Nineveh. And he was successful. Uh, God spared the people of Nineveh. So with this little bit of background, um, I would like to turn to you and ask you what, what was your impression when you saw this painting for the first time? Um, how do you feel about it? What do you think? 
what does it encapsulate? Does it speak to you? And we have our Amelia will help with the microphone tonight. Is it a high Renaissance painting? Is it a Caravaggio with lighting and chiaroscuro and tenebrism? <laughs> exactly, and that's perfectly fine. So it's a simple painting. But isn't there more to it? I mean, I actually personally like it a lot. Um, lit figure coming out of a dark chasm. He's emerging, you know, and he's a lit, you know, right. so that says something about Jonah perhaps yeah. as well, his redemption and yeah. following his. Oh no, I mean, because if we, if close to the reading, right, if we listen to this, Jonah was in the belly for three days and for three nights. So I think again, there is definitely uh, a connection between that and Although as simple as the painting is, it does bring that across, I think. I was struck by Jonah. It almost looks like he's got the stripes of having been whipped, which kind of follows up on uh -huh. the, the, you know, what happened to Christ. And I'm still trying to figure out who the fellow is in the lower right-hand corner there and his duck or mm -hmm. sheep or whatever that is. Right, I think this is all open for interpretation. Um, it can, I mean, the people from Nineveh waiting for him. Um, yep. With the, uh, it almost looks like that's a beach, you know, and maybe he is coming out of the whale at Nineveh. Uh, in terms of when somebody is there and sees it all happen. And I don't know if that's accurate, of course, but, you know. So instead of going in the whale, he's actually coming out of the whale. He's coming out, out of the whale. Yes. Uh, at the shore where uh, he was dropped by the whale for his preaching. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I see the whale as a place where God placed him to reflect. So I see the well not as a monstrous, you know, sea animal, but as a place where God placed him to really reflect and think about the call. Yes, I, I think so too. He was what do you do in, a, in the belly of a, of a whale, right? Then exactly, it's a time to collect yourself, to contemplate, and to come to grips, probably. And that's sometimes we have to do too. We are, we are facing going into a new job or um, a new life situation opens up to us and we can't just, just jump right into it. We probably want to run away, as Jonah did, um, but eventually we probably have to face it. And it comes through contemplation. It comes through quiet time, sitting down, going through it, what are my options? Um, how can I move forward? Yeah. Yeah, so I think this painting, again, um, I think it was a, it's a nice opening painting. Uh, it's, a, it's a good starter for the, for the Lenten time. Um, just to kind of complete the circle, when we think of Lent and, and what I was mentioning about ashes, all this Jonah had to go through, he, he probably learned a lot, he learned a lot about himself, but the beautiful thing, I think, is um, the quote that the, the, the third quote that I, I mentioned, and that we hear again next Wednesday in the gospel reading, is he was successful. 
he convinced the people they believed in God, they repented. And it was actually, he was reaching the king. I mean, it wasn't just the ordinary people. He was, con he convinced and he was persuasive enough to even for the king to take off his robes and sat, he sat in ashes to be hum humiliate, uh, to humiliate himself, to, to really follow the instructions. Um, and I think that's kind of a full circle we see with, with the Ash Wednesday, the ashes, which are um, marking the beginning of Lent. I'd like to know what the animal is below and what it might be a metaphor for. Again, I think um, we can, c it could be a goat or a sheep. Um, a this down here? Give Mark a It's what? I, I'm th I think it's a shorebird. A shorebird? A shorebird, like a... Oh, a seabird, or a seagull, oh, okay. or a, uh, right, something right. Like, or a goose, you know. Yep. But <laughs> it's walking on the shore, on the, and that light is sand. R right. And this person is walking along the shore and seeing this happen, you know. Going to spread the word that this guy just came out. Right. Of a you know, it could fish, also be you know. a bird. Yes, it could be a. Yeah. To a me, goose, it looks like a, a duck. goose, you know. But yeah. <laughs> right. What's that? <laughs> so there is no when we do these reflections very rarely is that I have the answers I mean I, I know a lot but I don't necessarily have the answer but it's because many artists didn't leave written instructions for us um, so particularly with a painting like this even though it's a contemporary work of art um, Mr. Hur he didn't leave an explanation, right? There's four paintings. There's the one on the swallow, and she's inside the house. And after the uh, painting where she travels, she uh, is in, in, inside the city of the city. And after that's the third painting. And after the other the fourth painting, where she runs on him on the water. So you, you you interpret it as a as a, a multiple hymn. Okay. come to the shore and welcome him to the shore. Sure, I mean, so it, it, it could be... Uh, no, of the four paintings. Well, well, when you say four paintings, I'm not quite sure what it you... It's four, four, four it's different frames. Four. It's a series of four. Oh, you, so... so that's the third one. That's the fourth. Oh, okay, so did we have a, a Herbert expert here? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I, 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 you I just happened reading, to... I was reading uh, about it. And, uh, oh, oh, okay, so... Oh, okay, so, yeah. Sorry. But we... I, 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 we, how I <laughs> <laughs> so, but she, I mean, she, she is a citizen of Nineveh in the series of the paintings. Right, right. I know, no, no, no. So, in yeah, but it's still, even with the series of the four paintings, it's, she's, my interpretation, and that could be, is open to interpretation, that she is one of the citizens of Nineveh, where he goes to, to preach repentance. Ulrike, I just have a comment. I, I really love the painting, it, it just makes me smile. Um, the whale looks nothing, or the fish, nothing like I ever have pictured it <laughs> in all the times I've read this story. Um, 
and the darkness of it. It does, it looks like ashes, just the color of it. I also just um, wanted to note, it's very small. It's 11 by 14 inches, mm -hmm. which when I look at this, I guess I would have thought it was a lot bigger, uh -huh. just because I think of the fish being big and the ocean being big and all that, so, but it's actually a very small work, so it's lovely. Yep. Thank you. I, I just have one more. Um, so this person is watching Jonah from the shore and seeing this amazing event, this, this being is coming out of this large fish. And the witness, that person is bound to take that witness to others. And others take it to others, to others, to the king. And so there's this amazing happening that has been witnessed that speaks to the power that this person has in connection with God, mm -hmm. I'd repent too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I would. It, it's a witness, and in in my, I would say it's a it's a witness of the people of Nineveh exactly to get the ball rolling, as you say. So, being being witnessed. Thank you, Amelia. I just want to encourage you to use the microphone because uh, when you speak, we have over 200 people on live stream. And so when you speak without the microphone, they're not able to hear and we like to engage them. Also, even across the room, it's difficult to really hear someone. So the, Amelia is an excellent microphone carrier. <laughs> so let's follow her. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I think uh, we, it's just time to move on because we have much more to, to discuss. Um, and my takeaway is uh, I think Herbert depicted the story of Jonah in a surprisingly and in a very dreamlike image. Um, this and other paintings by Herbert appear somewhat naive at the first glance, yet they are sophisticated works of art. Jonah and the whale clearly expresses a constant struggle to accept God's plan for us. And I will leave you with this question, am I, like Jonah, running away from God's message to repent? So it is now time to move on to our second work of art for this evening. It is the fresco, The Last Judgment, painted by Michelangelo between 1536 and 1549, located at the altar wall, which is the east wall of the Sistine Chapel in Vatican City. Michelangelo was born in 1475 in Caprice, which is a part of the Republic of Florence. At the age of 24, he had already created probably his most venerated marble sculpture, the Pietà, located in the St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican City. In 1504, he sculptured his most magnificent, David, which is now at the Academy Gallery in Florence. In 1508, Pope Julius II commissioned Michelangelo to decorate the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, which had been built within the Vatican between 1477 and 1480. Michelangelo, who saw himself as a sculptor rather than a painter, was reluctant to take on the work. He suggested that his younger rival, Raphael, should paint the ceiling instead. The Pope, however, was persistent and insisted that Michelangelo should paint the ceiling, leaving him little, just very little choice not to accept this assignment. The contract was signed in 1508 with the promised fee of 3,000 ducats, which is approximately $600,000 in gold. 
the final part of the ceiling was unveiled to the public on All Saints Day in 1512. The ceiling of the Sistine Chapel was immediately regarded as one of the greatest masterpieces ever composed and cemented it Michelangelo's reputation as the greatest living artist of his time. <coughs> he continues to be held as one of the preeminent artists in history. The fresco, The Last Judgment, was commissioned by Pope Clement VII more than 20 years after Michelangelo had painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Michelangelo was 66 years old at the completion in, 14, in 1541. The Last Judgment is a depiction of the second coming of Christ and the final and eternal judgment by God of all humanity. It was to be an eternal warning of the transitory nature of life and the universe. The dead rise and ascend to their faith, as judged by Christ, who is surrounded by almost 400 figures, including prominent saints. Originally, nearly all the male and angels were shown as nudes. Many were later partially covered up by painted drapery of which some remain after cleaning and the restoration of the painting in the 1980s and the early 1990s. As we consider our second work of art of the evening, I will quote from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31, 33, and 36, uh, 46. I quote, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels are with him. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous unto eternal life. End of quote. And I'm just curious who have seen the Sistine Chapel or the, the Last Judgment? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, quite a few. Nice, yeah. Um, and since it is a rather um, busy and compact composition, I thought we break it down a little bit and kind of go through the different scenes um, one by one. Um, and I will start with kind of the central scene, which is right in the middle, where we have Christ surrounded by the saints. And here it is. <coughs> and this is more of if you have been familiar with the painting um, or if you kind of recognize um, some attributes or even I think if we want to focus a little bit um, initially on the figure of Christ and the Virgin Mary which I think is is quite um, quite remarkable and if anyone likes to comment on it um, Yeah, the figures are very full, um, and one can really make out the three-dimensionality of the individual figures, absolutely. And I think the, the pose, and actually Jesus himself, Christ himself, is qu quite interesting. Um, if we, yeah. It's actually rather unusual at this time uh, if we think it's the high renaissance to see Christ without a beard. Um, so that was, so even though a lot of, there was a lot of, um, a lot of people liked and 
um, enjoy and, and was full of praise for the painting, but as usual, there's a lot of critics, and that was one of the main critiques uh, that was um, raised, that uh, Christ was depicted without a beard, for example. Um, when I when I first saw this, my first thought was he looked like an orchestra conductor. He has his hands, you know, in a very, you know, you can tell it's in movement. You know, to me, it's very fluid. It's very much in movement. And he's drawing up certain sections and pushing other sections down, you know, how a conductor has to, you know, to direct the par parts, you know. And then Mary, what's remarkable to me is you can see that she is demurring to his presence. She's turned away. She, mm -hmm. she is not emphasizing herself or her, her role here. His role is what's prominent, and she defers to that. Yes. I thought the pose was, it looks like he is truly judging. It's kind of a <laughs> Yes, yeah. You go this it, way and, and you go the other way and it's yes. and, the, and the look of you know my mind is made up and <laughs> I don't see it as a judgment but more exas uh, exa uh, yeah frustration uh, no, I miss a word I had exasperation it. Hey, thank you Ex exasperation okay he, 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 he's tired of it. Oh, okay. Go to whatever, and uh, she's scanning. Uh, come on, Mary is on the next to him, and uh, trying to. She doesn't want to see it happening. <laughs> it strikes her pose kind of strikes me as a bit odd. It's almost coquettish. I I don't know, like kind of. Um, it it doesn't seem really genuinely emotive somehow or something. I. She looks almost more like a, like a dancer or something than, than the mother of God. Okay. I question, question it too. I, I'm wondering, is it the Mary, the mother of Jesus, or is it Mary of Magdala? In, in this painting, it's the Virgin Mary. It is. Yeah, yeah in the, in just, just coming to, um, oh, yes, please, sir. I've seen the Sistine Chapel three times uh -huh. and never seen it since it's been cleaned. It's so nice to see the color. <laughs> it's just, this is wonderful. Yeah. And to see it in little pieces. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, many people commented on that and there's a, uh, there's some images on the internet where you cannot kind of kind of roll back and forth between how it used to look before the restoration and afterwards, and it's a difference of night and day, definitely. Absolutely. So just to kind of to and so yeah, we, we even just on this little area we could spend a lot of time. I just would like to to draw your attention. Um, a little bit further, so we have Jesus, and uh, yeah, I think we can interpret him in different ways. Um, I think there's definitely, I, I would go with the judging part, but uh, maybe he's also exasperated after a while having to do this. Um, so if we just have a quick look at um, some of the saints, and uh, so it's the saints and the apostles that are su surrounding um, Christ immediately. Um, it's n it was, even for scholars, it's hard to pinpoint exactly who is who, but there are a couple of um, figures that we can certainly distinguish. And so here to um, Christ's uh, left, there was uh, Peter, and we obviously can um, distinguish him by he's holding the keys and it's, um, it's a little bit, he's offering them back. I mean, it's, he's either holding them or you can also uh, interpret it as he's giving them back because um, there's no need for him uh, because Christ has opened and everyone is joining um, in heaven. Um, the other one, this is uh, St. Bartholomew. Do I say that correctly? 
Saint Simon, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and we can see that because he he carries his skin. So he was he was skinned alive. His martyrdom was that he was skinned alive, and in many uh, artistic representation, we see him holding his skin and al also um, holding the knife that was used to, to skin him alive. Um, one kind of a f fun fact, right? The face here is actually a self-portrait of Michelangelo. So um, he's very, uh, he, he included himself um, in, in the work. Um, and then down here we have angels blowing the trumpets, um, kind of awakening and um, announcing the second coming of Christ. Um, and up here we have some angels and then um, they're carrying the instruments of the passion of Christ. So the, the and we, again, I have, so the, the angels really blowing the trumpets. <laughs> <laughs> He's making, making sure he, he is loud enough that everyone can hear him. Um, and he, these are in the lunettes. So some of the angels are carrying the cross. Uh, some are carrying the thorn, uh, the birth of, and then here's the, the column. Um, where Christ was uh, flagellated on. Um, and then just to look down here, which is where the people are coming out of the graves, they're being woken, and they're being pulled up to be judged by Christ. And then they either will go to heaven uh, or they will travel over to this side um, to, to, to purgatory. Um, and so this is just an interesting scene. We, we see the people coming out of the graves. Um, they're being pulled up by angels in all kinds of weird ways, I guess. Um, and that's kind of, I think that's the Michelangelo way. I mean, the figures, some of them are absolutely beautiful. They're very sculptural. They're very muscular. But also, some are um, so bizarre, maybe strange positions. Um, um, and then, so these are the ones that are going, are pulled up into heaven here, being pulled onto the clouds. Um, well, this fellow just realized he's not going to go up. <laughs> um, he looks in horror and the, the, he's going to be pulled down uh, to purgatory. Um, and then, so we have a quick look at purgatory. Oops, we're running out of time. Um, so these are the, the lost souls that are being um, on the boat and, and being carried over, over to hell. Um, and then one of the criticisms um, was also that uh, um, Michelangelo had mixed mythology, Greek mythology, um, and pagan beliefs with biblical depiction. So he included uh, Sharon, um, who ferries um, the lost souls into the underworld, and he also included uh, Minos, uh, who was supervising the admission of the damned into into hell, um, and then again, kind of Michelangelo liked to to do some interesting stuff. So this is Minos, and when the painting was unveiled, again there was um, there was some criticism, and one of his greatest critics was someone who was very close to the Pope, and uh, that was uh, Biagio da Cesena. Uh, and he was very, very critical of uh, the work of Michelangelo. So Michelangelo went back to the Sistine Chapel and he um, changed the face of 
uh, Minos to the face of um, De Cassena, uh, and he actually also gave him some donkey ears. Um, so he, um, he kind of got his mischief on that. Yes? Well, he gave him donkey ears because in Greek mythology, Minos actually did have donkey ears. Oh, okay. he got on the wrong side of the gods and then he got turned, he got donkey ears. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Amelia um, likes to read Greek mythology, so she's always my specialist. So, I um, actually sorry to kind of have to go through this a little bit quicker, um, but Michelangelo certainly presented us with a very full picture of the commotion that will arise when Christ comes again. The angels and saints are close to Christ as we will await his judgment. And I think Michelangelo had a quite a clear vision, certainly in his mind, what heaven and purgatory would look like. And I will leave you with this question, with this question, does my life merit joining Christ and the saints in heaven? Following this busyness of the last judgment, I would like to conclude our first reflection on Lent, on Ash Wednesday and the beginning of Lent, with a much more intimate and contemplating painting. It is Magdalene with the Smoking Flame, painted circa 1640 by the French Baroque painter Georges de la Tour. Georges de la Tour was born in 1593 in Vic-sur-Sale, a town in the independent duchy of Lorraine in northeastern France. His family belonged to the provincial artisan class. Both his father and his grandfather were bakers. There is very little documentation about his artistic training or early career. Latour, heavily influenced by the work of Caravaggio, who died in 1610, when Latour was a young artist, is best known as a religious and genre painter with devotional scenes depicting deep contemplation and intense spirituality structured by dramatic effects of daylight and candlelight. After the unveiling of Caravaggio's first public commission in 1600, artists from across Europe flocked to Rome to see his work. Caravaggio's international reputation spread quickly thanks to the numerous French, Dutch, and Flemish artists in Rome who disseminated his style across Europe. The increasing demand for paintings by Caravaggio and his followers contributed to the rise of the Carrast movement. Artists who produced works in a naturalistic vein with dramatic chiaroscuro, an artistic technique that uses light and shadow to create deep shadows and deep three-dimensional structures behind the subject. Often treating subjects that Caravaggio himself had made popular. And of note, Caravaggio himself actually never painted a picture with a candle in it, yet his name is often associated with candlelight scenes. Latour, whose knowledge of Caravaggio was most likely indirect, took the genre to a new level of sophistication and refinement. As well as chiaroscuro, Latour used careful geometric composition and simplified painting of form. During his career, his work displayed different qualities from Caravaggio moving towards greater simplicity and stillness. Latour's religious paintings omitted Caravaggio's dramatic effects. Latour often created very quiet and intimate moments, leaving large expanses of the canvas empty. His surviving output is relatively small, despite often painting several variations of the same subjects 
it also applies to this particular painting. After his death at Lüneville in 1652, two weeks after the death of his wife, both of their death likely from an epidemic, Latour's work was forgotten until it was rediscovered in the 1910s. And as we look at our God on, on this beautiful painting, I will quote from Luke chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. The Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and on the day and the third day be raised. If anyone want to follow me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. The end of quote. And this is actually the gospel we, we heard today um, during Mass. And I'm very curious um, actually to let you speak about this painting and what you, how you feel about it, um, what strikes you on this painting particularly, what kind of jumps out. Um, um, so this painting speaks to me the most. I really like the silence in it and also the symbolic power. Um, and when I interpret this right, and the skull is a symbol for vanitas, and please help me out with the translation, <laughs> uh, Vergänglichkeit. Die what? Vergänglichkeit. Uh, Vergänglichkeit. Vergängli um. Like that every, everything has an end. So it. everything here, so our mortality, Mortal we can yeah, think mortality. of our personal mortality, something comes to an end, uh, so we can't hold on to, to anything. Yes. And I think also the candle shows um, yeah, a kind of um, the, the light that will go out in the end and it looks like she's, she's waiting for that, 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 that the light goes out, maybe her light, I don't know. And the books next to them, I thought mm, maybe it's um, like all the, the wisdom in your life and all the knowledge you gain has an, uh, an doesn't matter in the end because everything turns into ashes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh. Uh, this is such a peaceful sight, gazing at a flame, and yet she has her hand and a skull on her lap. Yes. Contrast. <laughs> Any thoughts about that. <laughs> Good. Yeah, has someone uh, does someone else have so thoughts about that? Um, a microphone here. Well, you can still I for some people they can contemplate their death with great serenity. And and if you look what's on the table and also the instruments of Christ's um, yep. passion, you know, his you know his the scourge and the cross are there. So she's she's contemplating all this, all these things, you know, life and death, and what's in between, and the wisdom of the ages, and the light and the darkness, and, and all these things are in this painting, you know. That and that contemplative sense of it is really strong to me. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Yeah, this this painting has. Uh, somewhat of a modern feel to it, it seems to me. Um, minimalist probably isn't the right word for it, but it kind of boiled down to the simple design elements. And uh, it, I would say it's appealing to C a Can you hold the microphone a little bit closer? Take a I'd say it's appealing to a, a modern eye in that it's fairly simple, simple and uh, boiled down design. Yeah. I was struck with the, the skull being kind of a symbol of death, but at the same time, the look on her face and the way that she's holding her hand is almost to me looks like she's in awe mm -hmm. and contemplating you know, what God has done for her and that, um, you know, and just nearly overwhelmed by that. And just yes, yeah, beautiful.
I'm interested to see that the amount of illumination on her front is really um, much greater than what I would expect from a candle. It seems like there's a little bit of disparity right. there. Sure. I would. And in the same time, uh, with all the symbols, she's not naked, but uh, she's pretty uncovered because you can see the knee and the shoulders. This is thinking way too much like an engineer or something, but a, a, a flame will, will smoke when there's too much fuel for the fire. So that's, so like with the candle, you have to trim the wick when it gets too smoky because there's too much wax being drawn up. The oxygen can't burn it all, so it burns off as carbon. So there's just too much fuel for thought here. You know, it's, it's overwhelming, <laughs> it's overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's not a candle, it's an oil lamp. Well, it, it, it's, it's burning oil, yeah. yes. So that's a, a very, um, oopsie, that's a very, um, so that's how you, so it's a, it's a, it's oil lamp in that case because, um, I think that's a, an artistic, he wanted to show his artistic talent because at that point it was just, um, they're working out how they would um, depict reflection. And so it is actually beautiful. You can see a little bit of the whip uh, reflecting through the oil. Um, it's just kind of right, right here. Um, because the, so the cross is over here, we can see um, the whip that was used for the flagellation of Christ. And then because the oil is see-through, so we can see a little bit of that um, in, the, in, the, in the candle itself, in the light. Um, so are you painting the hang on, sir. In the painting uh, that is described as a whip because she has the, the, the belt, she has exactly the same rope. Right, so um, I, I think there is the two mm. potential interpretations. So it's either for because she, it, so it's Mary Magdalene. Uh, she was considered a sinner. We, we see in the Bible Christ um, forgave her her sin seven times. Um, there's always this thought that she had a rather loose life and but she she repented and she was a, a great follower of Jesus Christ um, and so in in certain times for your personal repentance one would flagellate themselves so that could be an interpretation of that or um, since she's also has the cross so she's contemplating the suffering of Christ on the cross and he was flagellated um, that that represents the, the whip. Can you go back? She's focusing on the flame? Oh, she is, oh, so we can, we can so okay. she, uh, she's, I mean, uh, yes, she, I think she's contemplating on the light of the flame, but the, the, the whip is there. So, I mean, it's part of her, if you set up a personal altar at home, it's not, you just not necessarily have one item that reminds you of the sacrifice, uh, the, the suffering of Christ, you might have multiple objects um, on, your, on your altar. <laughs> so, oh yeah, we're kind of running out of time. Um, I think this is a, an, a beautiful, beautiful painting, um, just to kind of pull all the wonderful comments together here. Um, yes, I mean, and I kind of, because I like to draw lines so the, compos the composition of this painting is is very linear in a sense um, so she um, takes up half of the canvas over here the the top of the skull and her hand is the is the dead center of the painting so it really even though her gaze is on the flame but she probably um, we see her thoughts and her thoughts are 
mortality, my life comes to an end. But it also, mortality or the realization of that we are approaching the end of our lives, it's also very clarifying. It helps our minds to open up. We might see things differently. We might not go off after the little things that we might have gotten upset about before. So um, it actually, I think, has a dual role in here. Um, and just the books, again, I think that was uh, beautiful. It's, it's her knowledge, it's her wisdom. Ma Mary Magdalene was seen as the apostle of the apostles because she was the one who came first to, she was the first one to see Christ after re the resurrection. And she was the one to uh, tell the good news. Um, so I think that um, plays into it. And then the more technical part is um, Gutenberg had, developed his printing press in, in 1440s. <laughs> Thank you, I'm, I'm glad I'm, I'm meeting your expectations here. <laughs> um, so the printing press was developed in, in 1440, so we are already 200 years later, but if we think of that today, we would say, what, 200 years, that's not much. I mean, much more should have been developed. But in that time, time went slower, and so even by 1640s, very few people had books, um, but it was something that was coming up. I think De La Tour also tried to pull in um, the things that were kind of going on at the time. He was, the, I think, the, his artistic s skills, he wanted to present that, but also what was going on in the wider, um, um, in his wider surrounding. Um, so yeah, it, it just we are already over time. Um, I was actually thinking to expand this to two hours. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, sorry, a quick summary here. Mary Magdalene is an icon of penance. In the painting, we see her in deep contemplation and reaching for an internal experience. She intently focuses on the flame and the smoke as it ascends to heaven to redemption, to God. And I will leave you with this question. Do I make time, as Mary Magdalene clearly did, for contemplation, a key component of our faith formation? Thank you very much. <laughs>